Hi everybody, great to be with you. My name is Michael Millerman, and in this video, I wanted to talk to you about what I think is arguably Plato's greatest dialogue. This is called The Laws. A lot of people who know Plato know the Republic. Maybe you've heard of the Apology, where Socrates has to give a defense of himself before the Athenian jury that ultimately sentences him to death. And his time in jail is shown in another dialogue called the Crito. The day of his death is depicted in a dialogue called the Phaedo. So there are these dialogues that you might have studied when you were in university or that you have an interest in that you've heard of. For sure, the Republic has to be near the top of that list. But not everybody who knows Plato and not everybody who's studied Plato has given enough attention to this masterpiece of a book, Plato's Laws. I just finished a course on it at millermanschool.com, a complete walkthrough of this great masterpiece. And I just want to talk with you about it now a little bit. So first is, before we even open the first page and see the incredible opening line of this book, law. What's the great significance of the theme of law? Why would a book on law be so profound and so magisterial, why would it have something to say about heaven and hell, the human soul, and everything divine and mundane? So if you think about it, um, a closest parallel that may come to mind is the Old Testament, which Jews call the Hebrew Bible, and that is a book of law. I mean, it's a book of more than law. It's a book of Proverbs. It's a book of Psalms. It's a book of history in a certain sense, but for sure, you can't think of the Jewish religion, you can't think of Judaism, and you can't think of the Jewish Bible without thinking about the law, the Mosaic law, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, then later the 613 commandments, the full sense of Jewish law. And when a teacher becomes a rabbi in the Jewish tradition, among other things, he has to learn the law. That's a pillar of Judaism. And therefore, you could say very quickly that, well, this is kind of like Plato's Bible, like Plato's Old Testament, Plato's Book of the Law, Plato's Torah. Okay, then in the Islamic tradition, you have Sharia, another revealed code of law. So law is an all-encompassing system of regulating human life that includes within itself, as part of its concerns and as part of its nature, orientation towards the God or the gods, because it's a divinely revealed code of law. Moses gets the law or Muhammad gets the law. It's divinely revealed code of law. Because somehow, when you think through the problem of law, you have to pass through the question, who's the human being? Are there gods? Do the gods care about human beings? Because, you know, we're used to a model where the legitimacy of the law is somehow democratic. A law is legitimate if it represents the general will, let's say. Okay, I'm simplifying some ideas here, but basically, right? You can't just have a law. The law has to have legitimacy. You're in a crisis of the foundations of law when the source of legitimacy is no longer producing legitimacy, when it's no longer effective, when it's become toothless then you have a situation and the laws are not really followed or they're abused or people don't believe in them in the same way. So laws have to be legitimated. And one way to legitimate a comprehensive code of law is to see it as being given by God, whether or not it actually is. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but for sure it helps to legitimate it if people believe that it's given by God. And you can also imagine that law as a system regulating a political community has many other fascinating layers built into it. Like for example, what does the law aim at? What is it trying to accomplish? Is it just peace, order, and good government? Like in the Canadian case, is it uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? In another case, is the law designed to elevate the proletariat above the exploiting bourgeois capitalist financial class? Is the law designed to elevate the aristocracy over the mediocrities, the peasants, the workers, and the lumpen proletariat. In other words, 
even if you have a system of law that is designed to regulate social and political order, and even if you have the problem of the legitimacy of that law, getting us into the question of the existence or non-existence of the gods, the nature of the human being, and all of that, you also have this additional question, whom does the law serve? Factional interests or the common good? And how are those interests or that good interpreted? You see? Why do laws differ? What are the underlying opinions that account for the difference in systems of law? So all of this is to say that law is a big topic. You know, it's not just like, well, you know, if I go and steal a pack of cigarettes or if I'm going 140 when it's 120 on the highway or if my neighbor, you know, is too loud, what's my recourse? Like, can I call the police and file a noise complaint? Yes, you have all of the little areas that law regulates. You have small laws and bylaws and all of that. But at the same time, in the concept of law, you have the deep, the depths and the heights, okay, the foundations of the law, the aim of the law, the purpose of the law, the nature of the law. And therefore, law, to repeat, can become like a, a book on law can become like a Bible. Now, this is not even to mention, for those of you who are into that sort of thing, Aleister Crowley and the notion of law in other contexts, okay? Natural law. So you start to see that law is this big, beautiful theme. And with that in mind, you turn back to Plato's laws and you say, what does this great philosopher, so great that the rest of Western history has been called a series of footnotes to Plato. What does this great philosopher have to say about this great theme of law in this, his longest dialogue? So hopefully that's an intriguing start for you. And it gets better because the very first line of this, uh, of this book is something special and it tells you what's to come and it never stops. Okay. It goes from the first line to the first page, to the first book, to the last line and the last page of the last book of the laws, it's good from start to finish. You should know when I say book, like there's this whole thing and then it's divided into 12 books, like the Republic, okay? The Republic is divided into 10 books. This is divided into 12 books. So book one of the laws, it opens as follows. Well, I have to say one thing. There are three main characters. There's a character called the Athenian stranger. Okay, so he's not named, and he's from Athens, and he's outside of Athens, visiting, so he's the Athenian stranger. Then an old Cretan and an old Spartan. So three old men. Those are the main characters. There are other characters who are not present, like they are not part of the conversation, but they're invented. They're like, let's imagine we were talking to a young colonist. Let's imagine that we were talking to such and such a person. And then they have the invented speeches of these imaginary characters that they invoke for the sake of the argument, but it's really just the three of them the whole time. The Athenian stranger, the Cretan, and the Spartan, okay? And the Athenian stranger is with them. And he asks the following, is it a god? And in Greek, god is the first word of this book, okay? The first word of a book on law is god. That's why I told you it's like Plato's Bible, like his Torah, like his Quran, like his Sharia. It's his statement on the problem of divine law, the nature of divine law, the great theme of divine law. Is it a God or some human being, strangers, who is given the credit for laying down your laws? So who do you say gave you your laws, a God or a man? Now, you remember I told you about the issue of legitimacy. Basically, he's asking, or you could say, we could paraphrase in terms that are more comprehensible to us for a minute and say, According to your political communities, what's the source of the legitimacy of the law? Do you say that it was given to you by a man? Is it a man-made law? Is it based in man's reason and rationality or, or what? Or do you say that it's a divine law, that it's a divinely revealed law, that God is the one who told you what to do? A God is the one who told you what to do, how to live, what's right, what's wrong, and all of that. So who do you say gave you uh, the credit? Who, who do, to whom do you give the credit for laying down your laws? a god or some human being. Then Clinaeus, the Cretan, says, a god, stranger, a god, to say what is at any rate the most just thing. Among us, Zeus, 
and among the Lacedaemonians, that means the Spartans, from whence this man here comes, I think they declare that it's Apollo. Isn't that so? So right away, the Athenian asks and they say, Zeus and Apollo are the sources of their law. And now what follows, we can't go through this, that's why I have a course that I've been working on for a year, okay, on this book, um, a video course that you can get at millermanschool.com. What follows is an absolutely spellbinding inquiry into the nature of law, the function of law, all of these things that I mentioned, the aim of law, and how it begins, I should tell you a little bit more, because it's really amazing. I love this book. I mention it as often as I can in my other courses. I've probably mentioned it on my videos here several times in the past, if you've seen them, and I'm mentioning it to you here now, okay? Whether you take my course on it or not, you should be aware of Plato's laws. You should read Plato's laws. If you can't read the whole thing, read the first part at least. When I was invited to El Salvador recently to speak, I chose to speak on Plato's laws. Okay, it's such a beautiful and, um, as I say, um, amazing book. So what happens, right? They say, a god. We give credit to a god for our laws. And skipping over some details, okay, the Athenian stranger asks the following really good question. He says, to what end has your legislator legislated? Now, I give you the examples, peace, order, and good government, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the well-being of the international proletariat, right? The law can aim at something. Many people today who are critical of our laws, I think they're critical of the fact that our laws have what God said has called suicidal empathy. They aim at protecting the victims of crimes and, uh, excuse me, protecting the perpetrators of crime, punishing the victims. Okay, so our, our laws in many cases seem to be aiming at the wrong thing. The laws seem to have gone astray, right? If you think about that, why does a person like here in Canada recently, a woman stole, uh, she went to view somebody's cars like listed on whatever, Auto Trader or Kijiji or Craigslist or wherever it was listed. She went to see it and then she tried to steal it. And in the course of trying to steal it, ran this person over. And the next day she was out on bail. Okay, you know, a million cases like this in the United States. Every day you hear a story of a legal immigrant who's killed somebody who was out on bail or who had been caught or, you know, so there's a, there's a worry, generally speaking. Okay, again, I'm not going into all of the details here, but that when law no longer aims at, you know, justice understood as the punishment of criminals, but it aims at equity understood as forgiving of, uh, of criminals, then, you know, society moves in two different directions under those two different models. But to get back here, he asks, the Athenian stranger asks, to what end have your legislators legislated? And they reply, victory in war. Okay, the divinely revealed code of law has as its purpose, victory in war. And what's the evidence for that? Well, it has instituted communal meals so that people can eat like they do in a time of war. And it has trained them to become hardened to the elements and so on and so on. So the law has included all sorts of features and institutions and directives designed to help these cities be victorious in war. So here's where something incredible happens. Again, I just, I can't convey to you how much I love this dialogue, how much I think we can learn from it and how great it is to read and to reread, okay? But hopefully you get a sense of what I'm saying here. The Athenian stranger begins his cross-examination, which is a, an amazing thing. So what he gets them to consider is that a god, which they say they got their law from a god, a god wouldn't legislate for just a part of virtue, a God who does everything well, everything completely and everything perfectly, doesn't do anything by half measure, wouldn't legislate for a part of virtue, but for the whole of virtue. And since apparently, as he goes into in his argument, victory in war concerns primarily the justice, uh, excuse me, concerns primarily the virtue of courage, and it leaves a question mark over justice, moderation, and prudence, the other virtues, to say nothing of intelligence, okay? The fact that victory in war seems to require courage most of all, that therefore it seems to make courage the highest virtue, 
The Athenian stranger says, let's look a little bit more carefully. I know that a God is going to legislate for the whole of virtue, not for a part of virtue. And you've told me about the military practices that have been put in place to make you more courageous. Okay, facing your fears, going out in the cold barefoot, having to spend all night outside in the woods, like whatever is conducive to this army training. But now tell me, he says to them, where in your law has the legislator covered the rest of virtue? Moderation with respect to pleasure, justice and prudence. And they have no idea. They don't know. They're at a complete loss. So for them, the law is given for the sake of victory in war. Victory in war requires courage. And that's the end of the story. For him, a divine law has to address the whole of human excellence. When he asks them how it has done so, they don't know. And here's the opportunity where over the course of the entire dialogue, really, he can educate them about what a divinely revealed code of law should be. In doing so, there's this beautiful detail, which is that in effect, you could say, or you might think, and in fact, they become suspicious that the Athenian stranger is criticizing their divine law. You know, he, he's saying, your divine law giver seems like he put courage first, whereas I'm telling you that courage is not first among the virtues. And they're like, well, aren't you criticizing our lawgiver, meaning our divine code of law? Aren't you criticizing our divine code of law? Aren't you criticizing, you know, think about it. That, that's a serious thing to do, especially when you're in a community that follows that religious law, right? He's a stranger there. He's a visitor there. He goes there and he says, in effect, tactfully, delicately, not at first, but only after a while, hey, look at I don't think it's what you think it is. So they say, hey, look, you're criticizing our lawgiver. You're assigning him to a low rank. And the Athenian stranger says, no, I'm assigning us as the interpreters to a low rank. It must be that we don't understand something fully. You know, we're making a mistake if we believe that the God would legislate for just a part of virtue and for the lowest part of virtue at that. So what this book shows us among many, many, many things in the first 10 or so pages, again, there's just so much. It's so rich. It's truly incredible. I recommend you read the whole book. I'd love you to do my course on it, but read at least the first five to 10 pages, okay? They're really special. So what we see here among these many other things is what does it look like to reform a divine code of law tactfully? To move its emphasis, or at least to change how people understand it without undoing faith in its foundations. The Athenian stranger doesn't come along and say, huh, you guys are idiots. You think Zeus gave you your law? You think Apollo gave you your law? You're gullible. Wow. How did you even grow to be so old when you're so gullible? You know, he doesn't go in there and say there are no gods. He doesn't go in there and say God doesn't give law. He doesn't go in there and undermine the foundational pillars of belief in the law. But at the same time, he offers a correction or an improvement of their understanding of the divine law. And in doing so, he becomes a kind of co-legislator with God in the course of interpreting what God's law would have to be. And one of the dramatic details of the dialogue is that they are walking and they're walking to the cave of Zeus. The cave where, by tradition, Minos received the law from Zeus. So they're walking to that holy place where the divine law was revealed. And they never get there. So outside of the place of divine revelation, they have a conversation about the nature of divine law. And the Athenian stranger, with his intelligence and understanding, is able to guide that conversation to the extent that you could say they almost complete a code of legislation one that includes, honors, and reveres the gods, and moreover, that replies to the atheists, because a part of the great book of the laws is how should we respond to the atheists who undermine the foundations of the law? Amazing part of this dialogue, which you can find in book 10. And he accomplishes this great conversation without the presence of the gods 
immediately and not in the cave of revelation. So it kind of shows you what a legislator can accomplish when he's intelligent enough, has some time, the right sorts of circumstances, knowledge and understanding, and when he pays proper honor to belief in the gods as a pillar of the law. So we could sit here and talk about this book for a very long time. Okay, that's why it took me a year to make my course on this book. Every time I wanted to skip over a section to get through it a little bit more quickly, I just couldn't. There's too much you'll see all throughout here of my underlining everywhere. Okay, not to mention that this particular volume includes a nice interpretive essay by the translator Thomas Pangle, student of Leo Strauss, the great Leo Strauss. So I think there's a case to be made that this is Plato's greatest dialogue, that this is Plato's Bible. This is Plato's book on divine revelation. This is Plato's code of life. Yes, of course, the symposium is a beautiful work. Yes, of course, the Republic is a book for the ages. Okay, it's eternal. It'll never die. The Republic is its own special sort of masterpiece. But there's a case to be made for Plato's laws. Okay, you can find my extended table of contents. I'll put a link to it in the video. Okay, when I was a student at university and I was studying this book for the first time, I made like an extended 20 page detailed table of contents to try to map out what's happening in the book. So I'll link to that. I'll link to my course. Uh, this is what it is. Thomas Pangles, the translator. This is the volume that I recommend that you get. Great notes, great footnotes, great interpretive essay. And uh, read the laws. Be aware of it. It should be on your radar. Yes, read everything. Okay, read all of Plato. But uh, as you do that, there's a great deal that can be gained if you read the Republic and the laws and you think about the problem that they represent. Now, I have to be... I have to say this, okay? Otherwise, I won't have a clean conscience. You should read as much Plato as you can. Okay, Plato's foundational. And you should, you should read as much Plato as you can. The Symposium, as I mentioned earlier, is a very special book. All the dialogues concerned with the trial and death of Socrates. The 10 forgotten Socratic dialogues that are gathered together in the book called The Roots of Political Philosophy. I also teach that in the school, okay? So I teach those 10 dialogues plus the Republic plus the Laws. So there's a lot in Plato, but lately I'm on, a, I'm on a mission to tell people about this book. People who care about the big questions. If you don't care about the big questions, this probably isn't the book for you. But if you want to know what the greatest philosopher in the history of humanity, arguably, has said about one of the greatest topics facing humanity, the comprehensive issue of the regulation of the political community through law, and in particular, if you're attracted to this idea of the problem of divine law, the Torah, the Sharia, God, the law giver, the figure of the prophet who has to interpret God's will for the people in a code of law. If, if, if all of that appeals to you, I mean, if it doesn't, okay, this isn't the book for you. It's not the course for you. This isn't the video for you. But if it does, Plato's laws, not to mention that you have the benefit that Leo Strauss has written a book. Can't really say a book about it, it's kind of Strauss's prose retelling of this dialogue. It's very fascinating at times to compare what Strauss says with what Plato's Laws says and to see where they match up and where they don't. But I leave that aside. That's sort of an advanced project. Um, you'll find that there are many people in the history of political philosophy over the ages and past centuries who knew the laws, studied the laws, mentioned the laws, discussed the laws in the Islamic world, in the Christian world, in the Jewish world. And now here we are in our time, and I'm telling you, read this book, okay? So there you go. That was my little love letter to Plato's Law. No, I don't want to stop. Let me say a little bit more. I mentioned to you the beginning, three old men discussing law, Athenian stranger, Crete and Spartan. Who do you say gave you your laws, a god or a man? A god to say what is most just is their response, Zeus and Apollo. To what end did your god legislate to the end of victory and war? Whoa, 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 wait a minute, let's look into that. No, there has to be more to the story than that. A god would encompass more than that. Let's think about it now. That was what I said is discussed in like the first five pages or so. But let's fast forward, let's zoom through the book and just tell you some of the other topics that are covered. Drinking parties, probably didn't see that coming. Why are drinking parties discussed in a book on law? 
You're going to love it when you see it, okay? But they are drinking parties because you should know the Athenians are known for drinking. The Spartans and the Cretans are known for being dry, basically. They don't drink. And he defends the institution of the drinking party, but he defends it as a model for understanding any institution that is well run. And it's, it's, it's a great, great thing. Why is it good for people to get drunk together? Well, what happens when people get drunk? Don't you learn something about their character that you didn't quite learn in the same way when they weren't drinking? But at the same time, if it's just crazy, you know, bacchanalian revelry and there's nobody overseeing the drinking party, well, then oh, it'd be better if nobody ever had a drop to drink. But the Athenian stranger says, if you had this sort of well-instituted, well-run drinking party with a sober overseer, who was using it as an opportunity to judge the characters and souls of the people present in order to foster their education and to understand you know, where in the city's, let's say, offices they would be best suited. Well, that could be useful, right? He's like, you have states of artificially induced fear and panic as part of military training. But you want people to be courageous, not just in the face of pains and fears. You also want them to be able to deal with temptation and pleasure. So how do you have artificially induced training grounds for inuring people against excess pleasure? He said, what if he says, you know, if there was like a pain pill that a person could take so that you wouldn't have to risk them going out on military exercises where they might die, but you could have the same effect you could accomplish the same effect you could train them to be courageous in the face of pain if you just had a pain pill wouldn't the legislator make use of that instead of potentially getting them killed in military exercises he says yeah he probably would well here we have a pleasure pill so to speak wine okay pleasure pleasure inducing drink that you can use sort of for this laboratory of understanding the characters and souls of the people if it's overseen by a wise and sober ruler. If it's not, forget about it. As he says, there should be nobody drinking if it's not done in the exact correct way. So drinking parties. Uh, erotic pleasure. The problem of erotic pleasure. At the time that I'm recording this video, you have the Diddy scandal. Okay, Diddy's parties a scandal. And, you know, previously you had Weinstein. All of these sex scandals, okay? All of these issues that arise through the, how could you say it, <laughs> the force and somehow unlawful and distorting and destructive force of erotic passion. Whether it's because you committed adultery and another person doesn't like it and goes after you with a gun or a knife, or whether because you're, you are an immigrant in a country with beautiful women and all you can think about doing is raping them. Unfortunately, you know that this happens. Okay, or for some other reason, you just the problem of erotic desire. Like it or not, that's a problem for the political community. How do you regulate that? A person needs to love his wife and children, but not his neighbor's wife and children. He needs to love his country, but he's not supposed to love his enemy's country more than he loves his own country. So He's supposed to have some want and some desire, but it's supposed to be channeled in a certain sort of way. And because you have so much disorder and so many crimes coming from erotic lust, misplaced passions and unregulated um, force like that, what do you do? The law has to have something to say about it. But the law is not absolute. The law has to respond to and be limited by human nature. I can't legislate that everybody's gonna fly to the moon Somebody has to invent the rockets. Somebody has to grow the wings. Somebody's got to make the jetpack. The law can't. The law can't declare impossibilities. It can be persuasive. It can punish the people who don't follow the law, but it can't produce miracles. So it can't magically eradicate the erotic lust of quote young men full of sperm unquote who are mentioned in Plato's Laws. What do we do about young men full of sperm when we're trying to regulate the erotic affairs of the city? That's there. Relationships with ancestors, with parents, with neighbors, with friends, property. As I said, the issue of atheism is discussed. Do the gods exist? If they exist, do they care about us? If they care about us, can they be bribed? Can we just buy 
off buy them off get their forgiveness for bad behavior by giving them a certain sort of sacrifice or doing something else like yeah i'm gonna go commit a robbery but don't worry i'm gonna donate 50 percent of it to the temple thereby avoiding the wrath of the gods that's in here how should we deal with foreigners should the borders be open or closed what kinds of immigrants do we want and not want what should be the monetary policy how do you train people by law in a political community to become better and not worse or should the law really be just hands off just regulating cases of violence and so on and otherwise live and let live do what you want All of these topics and questions are here. All of our concerns about politics and law are here. All of the big puzzles and questions and issues and perspectives and opinions about what law should and shouldn't be are here. So, Plato's Laws. What can I tell you? Arguably his greatest dialogue. Nice, long, you need some time to read it. You have to have the patience to read it. You know, I'm going to say something else here. There's another... Great book on law I'm reading at the moment by Maimonides, a medieval Jewish rabbi, known in Jewish circles also as Rambam, Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, acronym Rambam, okay, Moses ben, son of Maimon, Latinized Maimonides, okay, Maimonides, Maimonides, Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, Rambam, has a work called The Guide of the Perplexed or The Guide to the Perplexed, it's been translated both ways, a new translation recently came out. As one of my students told me, alerted me to, so I'm reading that translation now. And Maimonides' Guide is a book for believing Jews who are also attracted by Greek philosophy and who are somehow trying to understand, well, there's a conflict at times between Greek philosophy and Jewish law. And we don't want to resolve that conflict by cutting off either branch here because we love Jewish law and we love Greek philosophy. And so we have to see is there any sort of way that we can reconcile that difficulty or think through our perplexity concerning the roots of the law and these contradictions that may arise between Jerusalem and Athens, between the biblical tradition and the tradition of Greek philosophy? So Maimonides' Guide is another great work, and it's another book that you could read together with Plato's Laws. So I said the Republic and the Laws, but also the Laws and Maimonides' Guide, they pair pretty nicely. Because in both cases, you have a comprehensive code of law, the laws in Plato's law and the Torah or the Jewish law in the case of uh, Maimonides' book. But you also have the problem of intelligence, intellect, the philosopher, the thinker, the one who is somehow trying to reason through the law and not just accept it on the basis of authority, even divine authority, who wants to understand it, really think it through, wants to engage his intellect from top to bottom through all of the rungs of the great ladder of the law. And... Maimonides, he says in uh, there are three books to the guide. The Guide of the Perplexed is divided into three books. And in the first book, which I'm uh, rereading now, there's a section where he addresses the following point. He says, why can't we, when we teach people, why can't we begin with theology? What's the difficulty of beginning with theology? And uh, this came to mind as I, as I showed you how long the laws is, okay? Because there are several difficulties in beginning with theology, which is that it requires some preliminaries for Maimonides. Like you have to know logic, you have to know mathematics, and you have to know the natural sciences. Those are sort of preliminaries. Not everybody has time for or desire for or the ability for the preliminaries. That becomes an obstacle. Then people also have their bodily needs. And some people more than others. If you always need to be eating, drinking, moving, uh, having sex, doing all of the things that the body requires, you're going to have less time and less energy left over for you know 500 pages of Plato's laws than the inherent difficulty of the subject matter and so on. So in that sense, it's not for everybody. Okay, it is not for everybody. There are short platonic dialogues you could benefit from if you want something short. But if you have the time, if you have the patience, if you have the inclination to go through a long book on law, then you're the kind of reader that this book was written for, okay? And you should uh, you should take up the challenge. Again, I have a video course on it. It goes, basically, it's an exposition all the way through, okay? So I read passages, I comment on them, I explain them, I interpret them, I connect them to other things that are happening in the book. I help you get the most out of your study of the laws and a bunch of other courses at my school that you can look at too. But there we go. I think, I think 
some of you maybe I have now convinced to read Plato's Laws. And uh, if you've done so already, I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Okay. If you have read some Plato but never even heard of the laws, I'd love to know about that. Okay. It's interesting to me. Uh, maybe this is the first time you're hearing about it. Maybe you didn't even know that it exists. Or maybe you knew, but you just didn't care, or didn't think it was very important, or ranked highly in the world of Plato's dialogue. So, whatever you want to say, say it. I'd love for you to comment, like, share, subscribe. Anything that helps this channel to grow would be great so that we can do more of these videos together on politics, philosophy, law, mysticism, and uh, and all the other things that interest us and that give us so much um, so much to think about and so much to discuss. Okay, so thanks very much for watching. Take care. Be well. Goodbye.